Uh, we're spending more on health care as a country and federal programs than we do on defense. Uh, that's unsustainable. Businesses and individuals are paying more for coverage now than they have ever, ever paid. And I think the thing that, that disturbs me, and, and uh, I remember Mark one day saying, um, we should invest more money in education. We ought to get more health out of a dollar in education than we do the next dollar that we do in health care. But what's happening today is that education, infrastructure, uh, uh, public safety, protecting the environment, those are all costs that are being uh, foregone because of health care. So uh, we're going to talk today about action and some background. And uh, I think the way to start would be to, to talk about the question of uh, <clears throat> balancing uh, quality and affordability. Uh, the notion of value is that we have the right balance between quality and affordability. So at, at the global level, uh, how are we doing? How do we compare uh, uh, with others? Uh, or how do you think we're doing striking a balance between quality and affordability? And is the American public getting a good value for their health care dollar? Uh, Mary, do you want to start? And then maybe we'll just yeah. walk through the panel. Well, I think, you know, the public has associated um, providing more services as being higher quality. And I, I think the Dartmouth researchers, however, kind of hopefully dispelled that when they studied Medicare over the decades and they found not only that there was tremendous variation in, quality, in cost, but that actually getting more services was associated with higher rates of mortality and morbidity and that therefore really uh, quality care did not necessarily need to cost more. It's actually, it's better the less that uh, can be better to do, have less interventions, less risk of longer stays in the hospital or multiple physicians not uh, knowing what the other is doing. When I run these, these estimates, I'd say if you were to, if we could somehow rapidly replicate the most cost-effective, high-quality approaches to delivering care at almost any unit of analysis, it would reduce healthcare spending in the U.S. by somewhere between 20 and 33 percent, and the quality would actually improve. That's the one-time opportunity to, uh, to, to improve both quality and affordability. I think the public has kind of associated a lot of the high quality with the rescue care. We're very good at rescue care, but they don't realize how important the quality is related to primary care. So I think getting more emphasis there uh, will be a way to uh, really help the public understand that's where quality begins, is having a relationship with your physician, uh, getting routine things done, uh, not overdoing some of those things. So. Um, there are ways in which we have to kind of help the public understand what quality is and be better at measuring it because we haven't been, we're really behind other industries in measuring and demonstrating quality. But I think part of what animates the public here is the reasonable presumption. I mean, care is one of those words that has a positive valence to it, right? How can more of care, it's like love, how could more <laughs> care be a bad thing? And you mentioned choosing wisely. I think one of the real positive features of that is that the profession itself is now beginning to step forward and say, you know, when we x-ray people too much, we actually give them cancer. Mm -hmm. um, when we operate on people too much, we actually cause side effects and damage that need not be caused. When we give people chemotherapy in their last two, two months of life, we often make them feel worse than they would have otherwise. And so part of the, the task, I think, is for those of us who believe that quality care is often less expensive is to help people understand how simply lavishing more procedures and drugs and things on people not only does not help them, but often is not a benign thing. It's not, you know, what could be hurt. Things can be hurt. People can be hurt. And so that's, I think, part of why people have difficulty with the, because they start with the premise that care is such a good thing, a little more must be better for you. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's uh, something that is important to, to point out. But 10 or 20 years ago, uh, people were using the R word when it came to reducing health care costs. Is, uh, shall I say it out loud, or, uh, or is that too dangerous? <laughs> the R word, rationing. Uh, is that not necessary, or do other countries achieve better value by actually not uh, allowing certain kinds of care to happen as, as much as it does in, in the United States? You know, I, as I said, I think the evidence suggests that it's primarily a, a cost per unit problem, not a volume of services. There are other countries in which 
the volume of services tends to be uh, a lot higher. And yes, you can point to individual countries where there are you know, waiting lists that don't exist in this country, but across all other wealthy countries, the, the difference in how much is being spent is not related to stinting on volume in other wealthy countries. So Arnie mentioned price. Earlier, or last year, there was an article by Stephen Brill in Time Magazine, probably your audience saw it. Um, everybody who's in the business said, oh, we knew that already. The civilians, their hair caught on fire when they read this yeah. magazine. And the notion that hospitals would charge 50 bucks for uh, you know, a Tylenol pill and $1.50 for a pin, and that institutions could have three and four and 500 percent differences for the same thing. This is really revelatory to lots of people who are outside the business who didn't know that this crazy Michigan has been going on for decades. And so I think part of what is happening in this era is that new benefits design says to people, not you have to go to this hospital, kind of what happened in the first wave of managed care, but as I told people yesterday, this hospital charges 10,000, this hospital charges 60,000. We, the employer, are gonna pay 10,000. We used to say you can't go here. Now we say you can go here. By all means, go there and take 50 grand with you when you go. Mm -hmm. So you can call that rationing if you want to, but my sense is people in the absence of any clear evidence that the $60,000 hospital is any better than the 10,000 will increasingly take the 10,000. And clearly greater transparency like that can make a difference. And I was gratified that the California Healthcare Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded a study by Mathematica to look at the impact in New Hampshire, where they've had an all-payer claims database for 10 years. Uh, they've been posting actually only 30 procedure uh, prices. And uh, in interviewing people, they found that um, it did, you know, it did impact the market, that they found that it created greater awareness, that there was variation pricing, and that led to scrutiny of higher price providers. Uh, that ended up a little bit of rebalancing between the negotiation of providers and plans. And that led to new benefit designs and made the, the employers more comfortable that, they're, that they could do this kind of, uh, you know, kind of benefit design. Uh, and in some cases, hospitals uh, created uh, care alternative sites that, at lower prices. They renegotiated some of their terms. Uh, and uh, the, the, the conclusion was without the initial investment in public price transparency, the changes in benefit design and price shopping tools would have gained little traction. So I do think this heightened awareness, and certainly the bitter pill was a great kind of spark to help the public understand, and it's really catching fire. And you know something about that effort in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> it's been labored. Say, say something about that. Yeah. Well, we, were, we, we did do our own study with a limited amount of data from the health plans to look at the variation in case prices, inpatient case prices, for a couple of dozen common uh, procedures and conditions like appendectomies or vaginal delivery and some knees and hips. And we found that there was typically at least a 40% range from the low cost provider to the high cost delivery system, both hospital and physician charges. And um, which was tremendous uh, variation for the same severity patient, the same type of service. And on an individual case basis, it was a multiple of that. That for even if you take out the end, you know, the top and bottom 5%, the smallest range of variation we found was 240% from case to case or 780%. So it, it, it documented what they've shown in other states where this has been apparent, like in Massachusetts. So, um, you know, we, we have our own variation here that uh, really isn't explainable. So variation is everywhere.